variable size reduction. Yeah. Here we are talking about problem size reduction. That is a basic idea for problem solving. When we solve computing problems, when the sizes are relatively large, then usually those problems are relatively hard. In order to reduce the difficulties, one simple idea, problem size reduction. Yeah. All right, so here, because this module recursive algorithms, we use recursive way so we can have a natural way to reduce the problem size. But here, this particular topic, B.2, we do variable size reduction. So each, each time, we do not know exactly how much we can reduce the problem size. It, that factor that relies on the intrinsic property of the of your computing problem. All right, so let's look at our computing problem. Our problem number nine, greatest common divisor. You are all familiar with this problem, right? Yeah, but here we still, as what we did before, we can learn a lot of things. Even we solve an old problem. So this is an old problem. You all have a lot of experience solving greatest common divisor problem. All right. First, let me just start with the problem description. Given two non-negative integers, m and n, but not both zero. So our input, two integer numbers, we allow them to be zero, but we do not allow them both zero. The reason is very simple. Yeah. yeah, so let me, all right. So let me just arrange my computer a little bit. Yeah. All right. So here, the reason why not both zero? <laughs> yeah, some of you may ask, why not both zero? The reason is very simple. Yeah, here, if I use GCD, function to represent greatest common divisor, two parameters, M and M. So that is the definition of this function. Yeah. The reason is if M equals M equals zero, does not exist. How about that? The GCD function does not exist. Think about that. Can you imagine what is the greatest sign? Definitely, it cannot be zero, right? Because one, yeah, one is a divisor of both numbers, okay? Yeah. So definitely, you cannot choose zero, right? Think about one. One is a divisor of n zero, one also divisor of, of n, okay? If after one, we can try 100. Is 100 a divisor of zero? Is 100 of a divisor of n, all right? And you can even go, you know, forever. Yeah, you know, any large integer you pick could be a divisor of zero, right? How can you define a particular number? You cannot say infinity, right? Yeah. Some people may think about infinity, but infinity is not a number. We know infinity is a symbol. It defines a concept. Infinity is a special concept. It is not a concrete number. 
So you cannot say infinity, you cannot treat infinity as a concrete number. So for that reason, we do not allow M and M both zero. All right, then the question, find their greatest common divisor GCD of M and N. Yeah, this question. All right. Now, next, we need to solve it. Yeah. All right, first, let me give you the reference on our textbook, chapter four, page 133. Yeah, you can study it. Yeah. Usually, when I give you the reference, yeah, so I check those locations, but I notice the materials provided in our textbook, not as much as what I cover in my notes in this class, uh, because I expand the material. So I add a lot of supplementary materials. So usually you will get more information to study my notes. Yeah. All right. Let's start from our middle school experience. When you were in middle school, most likely you need to solve questions like this, greatest common divisor. All right, so here, let me just repeat the typical procedure there. All right, we do it in several steps. Step one, find the prime factorization of M, prime factorization, yeah. I hope you know the prime number, the concept prime numbers. <laughs> Yeah, prime number, yeah. let me just go over a little bit. Yeah. One is not a prime number. Do not treat one as the prime number, all right? Yeah, the smallest prime number two. Yeah. That number has only two positive integer divisors, one and itself. Two different positive divisors, one and itself, two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, and so on. Right. Prime factorization. Yeah. We can factorize any positive integer as a product of certain number of primes. Prime factorization. Yeah. Very basic result in number theory. Number theory, yeah. All right. So step one, we just do prime factorization of M. Step two, find the prime factorization of N yeah. on both given integers. Yeah. Step three, find all the common prime factors between these two numbers. Yeah, so by observation, so we can look at for each prime factor, we like to get a highest possible power of that prime number as the common factor of both numbers, M and N. Yeah, so we will see. Next, I will use a simple example to show the simple method. Step four, compute the product of all the common prime factors. That will be the answer. Yeah. Let me use a simple example here. Yeah. So this method relies on prime factorization. All right. So we will discuss about this method soon, yeah. Look at this example. GCD of these two numbers, 10, uh, 60 and 24. First, let us write 60 as a product of a sequence of primes. Two squared times three times five. Actually, in the number theory, we will know the prime factorization if we arrange in this order, okay? Yeah. You know, in the ascending order for those prime factors, 
And uh, for each prime factor, we write the power of that power of that prime factor. Yeah. And uh, that representation will be unique. Yeah. You, unique prime factorization theorem. In number theory, that is a theorem. Okay. Called a unique prime factorization theorem. Yeah. All right. For 24, we have this prime factorization. Unique. Yeah. So after that, then we look at each prime factor. So two, look at two. The highest power of two, that is the common factor of both numbers. That is two squared. Okay, two squared. Common factor of both 60 and 24. Similarly, power of three, just three. Okay, where is that three? I, I need to put three here. Yeah, missing. Yeah. All right. Then power of five, you know, we don't have greater than factor. Yeah. So we don't take power of five here. So we get the answer 12. Yeah, that's easy, right? Think about that. We can find the answer easily. All right. But the question is, the question is, why we need to solve it the second time, right? Yeah. So the question, yeah, we can find this, the solution using the middle school procedure easily. Why the second time? Yeah, let me write in a short way. Why we need to solve this problem the second time, right? Redundant, right? Yeah. The simple reason is, if we need to solve it the second time, that means the first solution is not good. The first solution is not good. Okay, yeah. So our middle school solution, not good. Okay, what do you mean not good, right? Yeah, in our algorithm context, not good means not fast, not efficient. Because in our middle school questions, we do not calculate prior, uh, GCD for large numbers, right? N and N usually you only work on relatively small numbers. You never work on huge numbers, right? <laughs> yeah, because you cannot do such questions for n and n are huge numbers, okay? One billion, one trillion, more than one billion, one trillion. Think, think about those huge numbers. But in this algorithm class, when we solve GCD problem, we need to solve the cases that n and n are arbitrary two integer, two positive integer numbers, arbitrary. So especially for huge integer numbers, then this method, this middle school method has the bottleneck. This is the bottleneck. Bottleneck. That means <clears throat> the prime factorization step is extremely slow when M and M are huge. M and M are huge. How slow? Here, let me give you the idea. Let me give you the idea. Think about if M and M are given as big, huge integers with thousands of digits. Can you imagine that? Thousands of digits. Thousands of digits. All right. Yeah. Then even you use supercomputer to solve this problem. You may need years, many years to find a solution. 
even supercomputer, you need many years. Yeah, many people tried that before. Many people tried that before. I remember uh, one college professor gave such a prime factorization problem for 6,000 digits. All right, 6,000 digits, you know, to challenge the community. So that, that's, you know, a long time ago, 20 something years ago, challenge the community. Yeah. You know, whoever you want to try using, you know, supercomputers, you know, any means you can use. Yeah. As I remember, after half a year, nobody can could find a solution. Even after uh, half a year, the whole world, nobody could find a solution. So slow, all right? There you can see if your GCD algorithm relies on prime factorization, it will break. This method useless. This middle school method is basically useless for huge M and N numbers. Yeah. So for that reason, in this algorithm class, we need to find a much faster algorithm that does not rely on prime factorization. Yeah. Fortunately, in this module, we can use recursion, recursion, recursive algorithms. We can reduce the problem sizes step by step. The result extremely fast, even for huge numbers, thousands of digits. I, I didn't try. <laughs> I didn't try. Yeah, but it's quite interesting. So yeah, probably, yeah, I can make a project, programming project, you know, uh, problem. Yeah. Then we can try factorization, or not factorization, because we get around prime factorization, right? Here, I do not try to do prime factorization fast. Yeah, because it's impossible, all right? It's impossible. Yeah. Using the current technology, it's impossible. So I we basically get around that prime factorization. Yeah. We you will you will learn that method after let me see 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, you will know the answer extremely fast. Even thousands of digits. You do GCD, not prime factorization, GCD. You can get an answer, you know, in fraction of second <laughs> that fast. Think about that. All right, so let's look at that magic solution. Yeah, although magic, but it's quite basic, quite simple. Yeah, you will see the power of power of recursion. Think about power of recursion. Without recursion extremely hard to solve. Yeah, even the simple problem, extremely hard to solve. Yeah. All right, now our new solution. Yeah, relatively, you know, with respect to our learning curve, yeah, new solution, reduce the problem size. It's our goal. Yeah. How to do it? Yeah. Recursion. How to apply recursion? Even someone told you using recursion, you may not know how to do it, right? Yes. So still, you need to solve some critical technical problem on execution. Yeah. Strategy. Here we can treat using recursion as our strategy high level direction but we need to find some effective way as the execution here let's look at the execution part 
a mathematical tool. We need this tool. It's a simple tool. Everybody is familiar with, you know, also in your, you know, middle school. Yeah, the middle school level tool. Yeah, that's the division algorithm. Integer division, basically on integer divisions. You know how to do integer division, right? Yeah. So here we write it in a formal way and we call it a formal name, division algorithm. All right. Given positive integers A and B, B, yeah, if I say positive, both not zero. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we yeah, we can we can yeah. Anyway, anyway, yeah, we can fix this easily. Yeah. All right. B not equal to zero. All right. Okay. Divisor. There exists unique integers Q and R. Q for quotient, R for remainder. All right. Yeah. With zero less than or equal to R less than B, such that. Yeah. A equals B times Q plus R. That's the division algorithm. Very simple, right? Yeah. But it is very powerful. Division algorithms in number theory, it is very powerful, extremely useful. Yeah. All right. So here we needed this tool to do problem size reduction. Yeah. Then we can replace A by M and the B by N. Then we can find appropriate R. Yeah. So we can reduce the problem size. Yeah. Here, we, regarding the problem size related to M and N, if we assume M the larger positive integer we are considering the magnitude of m magnitude magnitude of m that is here our problem size because the larger the value of m the harder the problem Okay, yeah. So we treat magnitude usually, yeah, not always, usually. All right. Yeah. All right. So then we do this magnitude reduction, size reduction with respect to the magnitude. All right. All right. So then if we write, yeah, I'm cover a little bit. If we write the Division algorithm version. This is the new division algorithm version. Okay. All right. Then, based on that, let us develop a key property for size reduction. All right. Through transformation, we need to manipulate the formula to make it a new different form to reveal some intrinsic prob property. Yeah. So let's take a look. This GCD, M and N, yeah. we can reduce it in, you know, we, here we just replace M by NQ plus R by the division algorithm, okay? Yeah, but after that, we need to do reduction. But when we do reduction, let us look at the fraction M over M, the left-hand side. If we replace M by, by NQ plus R, after simplification, we get the right-hand side, Q plus R over M. But that Q, is the integer part. 
the integer part does not have impact on the fractional part, right? The integer cube, bigger, smaller, it won't impact how much you can simplify in this fractional part, right? Yes, for the fractional part, basically, when we do simplification, we try to cancel out the common factors of R and N as much as we can, right? But when we do cancellation, there is nothing to do with that Q term, right? Yeah, that means we can drop that Q terms, right? Drop that Q terms. And here, that means we drop that NQ part. Yeah, nothing related. So then we derive a simplified version, GCD of N and R, N and R, okay? And at this time, do you see the problem size is greatly reduced? Right? Yeah, the magnitude, right? The magnitude of larger numbers of N and R, the magnitude here will be smaller than before, right? Because we look at the magnitude here, right? Yeah. So it, it becomes smaller. Yeah. But can we do further reduction? Further, do you, like, you know, and uh, that kind of recursion until we reach the end, that means we cannot do further reduction anymore. At the end, yeah. what is the end case? Think about that. Can you imagine the end case, right? The end case is very simple. The first parameter is a multiple of the second parameter. All right, yeah. GCD of, yeah, let me write, you know, KR comma R, okay? Yeah. At the end, you may have this situation. The first parameter is a multiple of the second parameter, because after that, you can get answer uh, not K. So it's it's R, right? Yeah, because common divisor. The answer is R, so you are done. Yeah. Before you get the answer, that is the last step, okay? Last step before you get the answer. All right, yeah, yeah. So eventually, you will reach the end. That is the whole procedure of the new solution. Okay, all right. So now let me summarize the description of this method. Yeah, all right. And we will have other our solution. Yeah, this one, there is a famous name, this, this whole recursive algorithm there is a famous name for it. euclid's algorithm euclid's algorithm yeah you know more than 2000 years ago it was discovered by euclid more than 2000 years ago you can imagine how smart euclid it was right yeah okay all right so let me write the rule or Euclid's algorithm. GCD of X and Y equals three different cases. The first case, if Y equals zero, just returns X, but we need to make sure X not equal to zero. Okay, yeah. Uh, second case, y not equal to zero but x is a multiple of y x mod y equals zero okay x mod y that percent sign you know the meaning right yeah so we're familiar with the this percent operator yeah in our programming language yeah x mod y the remainder equals zero that means x is a multiple of y, 
then the answer is y. The third case, recursion. Recursion. Yeah. All right. Then with the simple representation, yeah, that's the Euclid's algorithm. With this simple representation, you can write implementation easily, right? Yeah. So here I do not need to write it out. Yeah. So you can write it easily. Yeah. And uh, you can see the case number three that reflects the problem size reduction details. All right. Yes. So that's a you know simple, neat way to do the problem size reduction. And it is a variable size reduction, right? You cannot predict how much is the size reduction. Nobody can predict that. Okay. It varies, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, then we find a solution. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's the our problem, computing problem number nine, module B. Yeah. Uh, here on my notes, I have this B.3 general solution for the binary bits problem, but I need to modify my plan a little bit. Yeah. Here, let me explain why I need to do some adjustment at this point on our plan. We know uh, we, we fall behind a little bit. Yeah. So based on our schedule plan, we fall behind a little bit. Yeah. We need to catch up, okay? Yeah, so I try to adjust materials, cut off some relatively not that important materials. Yeah, but for the important materials, I need to explain. Yeah, I cannot cut off important materials. And for this part, uh, relatively less important. Yeah, for remember for our binary bit problem, we use guess and verify strategy. And we complete the guess part. Remember? Yeah. So the, you know, the formula for the guess part, yeah. A of N, at the end, we write one plus the flow function of log base two of N. Right? Yeah, that's our guess. Yeah. But how do we make the guess? Yeah. Our guess come from, yeah. It comes from a special case where n equals power of two. Then we derive a formula, then we make a reasonable guess. Yeah, remember that? That's our procedure. But the missing piece is how to verify it. How to verify that this guess is correct. That is the B.3 topic. Okay, yeah, it's important. Yeah. But I like to skip it. Yeah. In order to solve the problem completely, we need to do that verification step. Yeah. But here, the reason, uh, we won't lose much even if I skip this part because this verification part rely on another mathematical tool that is the mathematical induction. You heard of that, right? Mathematical induction. A powerful method. In your discrete math, math 3000, discrete math, you need to spend quite some time to study mathematical induction. It is pretty hard, yeah. Here we need to use that, yeah. The good thing is, in my next topic, part C, we will learn Fibonacci numbers. In that place, I need to apply mathematical induction another time, yeah. So two, twice, all right? here and there, two places. Then I just skip this one 
and uh, do that Fibonacci number that, you know, I only use mathematical induction once there, okay? In this way, I still, I show you how to use mathematical induction to do verification for a different result. Yeah. That result, we also we make guess and verify. Yeah, but we just uh, combine twice mathematical induction verification to once. Yeah, so we won't lose much. Yeah, just a little less practice. Yeah, so that's my plan. Okay, all right. So let me stop uh, part B here and switch to part C, yeah. our new topic today, yeah, of C, Fibonacci numbers. So then for this topic, uh, I plan to, you know, make this topic as the content for our project number two. So, you know, it's important. Yeah, I will cover all the details here. All right. Yeah. So, at this point, most of you have submitted project one. Yeah. But for each class, I noticed there are some students still not have not submitted. Yeah. But we need to prepare for our project number two yeah. calculating Fibonacci numbers because we have good algorithm and a bad algorithm. You know, similar, similar way as in our project number one. Yeah, you will compare how fast using, you know, bad algorithm, good algorithm, method one, two, three. All right, yeah, but you need to do a lot of things. Yeah, so we will, we will be there, yeah, all right. C.1, introduction to Fibonacci numbers. Yeah. All right. First, let me give you the question description. Yeah. Problem number 10, calculate Fibonacci numbers. Yeah. Given recursion formula, yeah, it's a simple recursion formula. So simple, yeah, but it is so famous. Fibonacci number so famous. There are many interesting results related to Fibonacci numbers. Yeah. F0 equals zero, F1 equals one. So two initial values for Fibonacci numbers. After that, the remaining Fibonacci numbers are defined by a simple recursion formula, this one. F sub n equals F sub n minus one plus F sub n minus two for n greater or equal to two. That simple formula, yeah. But the result, you know, yeah. So we need to find, so the question, we need to find Fibonacci numbers, but it's non-trivial. The problem is very interesting non-trivial, okay, yeah. So let us learn the, you know, several different methods to solve this problem, okay, all right. Yeah. Here, uh, we just plug in numbers for the first few Fibonacci numbers. So you can see the sequence. But if you try, try to find some rule, it looks like there is no obvious rule among these numbers, right? Yeah, you know. It looks like some random numbers. Yeah, how to find some specific obvious rules? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. The, here is the reference on our textbook. On our textbook, the reference pages are pretty short. Yeah. So, but here I like to give you more information. Yeah. So, we want to understand 
this problem completely. Yeah. Our plan, we, the first one, we solve it algorithmically. Yeah. So we try to develop some algorithm to solve it using computer programs. That's our plan number one. Yeah. Yeah, write a computer program to implement some algorithm here. Yeah. All right. Plan number two, solve it mathematically. Because we have a concrete mathematical formula, it is a recursion formula. Is it possible someone can find a smart way to find the mathematical formula for Fibonacci numbers? Yeah, it's interesting. If one can find such a formula, then we just plug in numbers and find answers. How about that way, right? Plug in numbers into a formula and find the solution. How about that? Okay, yeah, all right. Derive a math formula. So our second plan, yeah. All right, the first plan, you can see there is a simple implementation in recursion. How about that, the simple relation, yeah. We define a recursive function, FIBO of one parameter integer n, then we do recursion. Yeah. Two base cases, initial conditions, zero and a one. Then the last line, recursion call. How about that? How simple it is? Hey, right? yes. Why we need to spend so much time to study solving this problem? Right? Such a simple solution. Right? Is it good enough? Yeah. We have learned quite some time at this point. Yeah. Approximately one and a half months, right? Yeah. One and a half months. Yeah. At this point, we need to think about first, is this a good algorithm? Second, if it's not good, how to improve it? Right? Yep. Yeah. That's the natural question we need to ask. Yeah. All right. So here we will learn something the bottleneck thing. Yeah, some bottleneck thing. So here we have another situation, the bottleneck situation. Yeah, bottleneck. So this place that would cause performance slowdown in this place, recursion. All right, why is that? Yes. We need to find it, yeah. And here you can see, due to this bottleneck, yeah. So I will make this part, method one, method number one in our project number two, okay. This bad one, yeah, usually our method one, it, is the slowest method, right? Yeah, as in our project number one. Yeah. In our project number two, you will do experiment. You will see, you know, pretty slow. Yeah, method one, yeah. All right. Is there a good implementation? We need to see the answer in my next slide. You will see it. Yeah, it's not good. All right. The answer is it is a horrible implementation. Yeah, not just bad, you know, too bad, extremely bad. Yeah, horrible. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to describe how bad it is. Yeah, but you will see. Yeah, how bad it is. Yeah. All right. Let us 
see why it is so bad. Now, in the second slide, we will see why it is so bad. Yeah. All right. Here, I like to draw a recursion tree. Let me just uh, repeat a few steps in the recursion to show you why it is so bad. Yeah. All right. When I start, I start to evaluate Fibonacci number six. It's a relatively small number, right? Six, so small. Yeah. So we can very we can find the value of it easily, right? Yeah. So you can write on your paper, you know, fiber of six easily. But if we call the recursive function to find this value, I want to show you how much work we need to do or the computer program needs to do to find this number. Yeah. We do recursion. The first time the recursion, we need to find the value. Fibre of five and a fibre of six. So we put these two numbers at the second level in our recursion tree. Yeah. Under the root. The root is fibre of six. Yeah. But next, in order to find fibre of five, you need to do another round recursion, right? Yes. This time you need to find fibre of four and a fibre of three. Similarly, for fiber of four, you need to find fiber of three and a fiber of two, and so on. Okay, until we reach the very bottom. That is the whole tree. Look at this tree. Okay, to find a fiber of six in your computer program, you need to produce this whole tree inside your computer memory main memory okay how about that remember i use a stack to show you the implementation before right how to implement recursion in a computer we use the stack data structure here this whole tree is stored in a stack you can see how big is that stack when the input number is big yeah, because our general n could be a big number, right? If we plug in a relatively big number, you can imagine how large is that stack. All right, yeah, okay. That will cause a problem, right? Yeah, here, let us do some simple observation. Okay, yeah. If we need to produce this recursion tree, in our computer main memory, yeah. what is the biggest problem you can observe here in this tree? The biggest problem you notice in this big tree. Yeah, just some obvious property. You can see immediately, okay? You can see immediately, yeah. A lot of it's uh, great, yeah, comment. You find it immediately, a lot of redundancy, yeah, super redundancy, yeah. Let's look at just the one node. How much is the redundancy? Let's look at a fiber of two. How many times fiber of two is repeated okay look at so many places fiber of two in this relatively short recursion tree it has been repeated five times in this short tree think about when n equals 100 can you imagine when n equals 100 <laughs> yeah we know 100 is not a super big number right 100 how, how can you call 100 is a very big number right yeah how big is the whole recursion tree how many times fiber of two will be repeated in the recursion tree when n equals 100 can anybody imagine that 
<laughs> it's scary the number of times that fiber of two will be repeated you can also imagine other fiber numbers also repeated many many times that's scary right yeah too much redundancy yeah so the question is how do we reduce that redundancy how do we avoid not just reduce we want to so here the idea is we want to completely avoid any redundancy is that possible completely avoid eliminate now that's it completely eliminate the redundancy that means each fiber number in our tree we only want to calculate it exactly once how about that no second time no second time calculation only one time calculation how about that plan so an obvious improvement is eliminate redundancy in this recursion tree right. that's our next step we will do that yeah yeah hope uh, but fortunately the solution is not complicated it, it solution is very simple here i like to show you two simple solutions not just one two simple solutions yeah all right how to improve method one method one we do not use recursion we use iterative algorithm then we can avoid redundancy easily okay yeah so that's one way to avoid redundancy use iterative algorithm yeah. the pseudocode is simple just a simple for loop that simple here you can see there is no redundancy okay here you can see each fibonacci number is only calculated once we get around we avoid we eliminate the redundancy in this way yeah but one thing yeah the good thing is this method is so simple okay so simple and it's so good not just simple it is really good okay one thing but the second thing is uh, for for us okay so we we are computing problem solvers we will be future you know computing problem solvers and we will solve many relatively hard real world computing problems in the future okay yeah so we are not satisfied with a solution like this although we do not say it's a bad solution but it misses some important point here yeah miss some point miss some point here okay yeah the point is no recursion no recursion and here we are, we look at the negative negative impact negative impact okay yeah. why no recursion has some negative impact that means this method won't work when we need to use recursion to solve real world computing problems okay think about that yeah let me repeat yeah you know this logic reasoning uh, here uh, we need to spend some time to understand this method cannot be used when we really need to use recursion to solve real world problems let's say in that way 
because in the real world, we will have a lot of situations that we need to use recursion to solve real world problems. We cannot avoid recursion. For example, we have learned two such computing problems for which we cannot avoid using recursion. The first one is the first one is the power of Hanoi problem. Okay, the power of Hanoi problem. Can you find a non-recursion algorithm to solve the power of Hanoi problem? You cannot. I cannot. Too hard. Okay. But if you look at our recursion solution, it's very short, very simple, just the four or five lines, we find a solution. But for non-recursion, we, we, we cannot do anything, okay? We cannot find a neat, decent solution for it, okay? So that's one example. Second example, we just learned we just learned 20 something minutes ago, yeah, GCD problem, calculate GCD problem. Think about that. Can you use non-recursion way to solve it? We cannot, right? You clear this algorithm, that's a recursion solution, okay? Without using recursion, extremely difficult think about that extremely difficult yeah so you will see in the real world computation problems there are many relatively hard computing problems we cannot avoid recursion algorithms that's the reason we need to study this module three okay it will be extremely useful extremely powerful, okay? Then you can understand a negative impact because our first solution, there is no recursion involved. That means if we really need to use recursion to solve our computing problems, our method one does not help, okay? Does not help. Yeah. So we need to find really find the re recurrence solution recursive solution how about that now we still yeah, so here our goal is clear here we want to eliminate redundancy completely with recursive algorithms how about that that is our goal okay even when we we still we use the recursive algorithms but we are able to eliminate redundancy 100 percent how about that goal all right yeah. let me show you that idea can be achieved using a simple neat way pretty simple but very neat yeah. let me use about less than 10 minutes before we end this class to describe that neat idea pretty short and a very neat idea okay all right method number two let me just put some important properties here before we get into the detail first recursive algorithm without redundant computation that's our goal okay in this method we set our goal like this okay yeah that means we still we do not throw away our previous recursive algorithm we have one that huge recursion tree that one okay very bad one but we do not throw away that bad solution in trash, okay? 
we still, we try to modify it. We just do some simple modification to make it, you know, work as we want. Okay, yeah. Number two, use an array to store calculated values. Yeah. Here, so what's the meaning of that? That's number two. Yeah, this idea is very important. Use an array to store calculated here, the calculated Fibonacci numbers. We know each Fibonacci, each intermediate Fibonacci number needs to be calculated multiple times, right? But when you calculate that number multiple times, do you need to calculate the first time? You need to calculate the first time, right? You need to start with your first calculation. After your first calculation, then you do second, third, and so on, redundant calculation, right? So we treat after the first calculation, all the remaining calculations are redundant, right? Yeah. Here, the idea is very simple and natural. Can we just keep the first calculation and stop doing the remaining calculations? How about that? Okay. We only do the first calculation. After that, if we can detect, this is not the first calculation. This is the, you know, later calculation. We stop. We don't do it. How about that? That idea. That simple fix. Okay? Yeah. So this is, that is this, you know, number two point. Use an array to store calculated values. Yeah. All right, make sure that no value is calculated more than once. Yeah, yeah. So we want to do, yeah, we know we need to do this number three point, but the question is how to do it, right? How to do it? How to use a simple way to do it, right? Yeah, the good thing is there is a very simple way we can do it. We can, you know, detect and stop new calculation. How about that? We need to do detection first. Then after we find that the new calculation is not necessary, we stop it. That's the idea. That's our modified new idea. Okay. Yeah. So let us look at the implementation yeah. this idea there is a fancy terminology for it dynamic programming idea that's the topic of chapter eight yeah. in this class we may not have the time to cover the whole chapter eight yeah but here we have a chance to learn the idea of dynamic programming Okay, yeah, so that's a very important topic in computer algorithms, dynamic programming, okay, yeah. So let me, yeah, the essence of this method, no repeated calculation. The reason we, we use dynamic programming method is avoid repeated calculation. That's all we need to do here. Dynamic programming, okay, all right. So let me explain a little more our method number two using dynamic program, okay. There is another term for it, it we call a dictionary method. Dictionary, what is the dictionary? Yeah, think about, here we use a new data structure we call a dictionary. So what is a dictionary? For the Fibonacci numbers, we need to calculate intermediate Fibonacci numbers, right? After we calculate the intermediate Fibonacci number, we need to store in some data structure, right? We call that data structure a dictionary. Yeah. So we calculate intermediate Fibonacci numbers and we store them in a dictionary. Why we call that data structure dictionary? Because we can look up in the dictionary. 
right? Yeah. How do you use the dictionary? You look up words in the dictionary, right? Here we look up Fibonacci numbers in the dictionary. That uh, analogy, that kind of analogy, all right? Yeah. So here we have just the three points we need to have. The, as a result, this is the final implementation. We modify our beginning recursive algorithm FIBO function, but we create an array called a known f of i array. Known f of i array. Yeah. And then before we do new calculation, we do detection. This step, this is the detection step. Why we call it detection step? Because if you have a known Fibonacci number stored in this array at the position i, then before you do calculation, when you check, it is already greater than zero. Oh, sorry, already greater than zero. That means you do not need to do new calculation. It already has a valid Fibonacci number in that location. You do not need to redo it. You do not need to recalculate it. Okay, you have to stop. How to stop? Return. Return means stop, right? Return means stop immediately. Okay, you return that value. Stop immediately. All right. Otherwise, only when it equals zero. Then you need to move down to do the remaining lines. How about that? The remaining lines, you need to do recursion, okay? But you need to add an extra step, assignment step. After you find a new Fibonacci number S, you assign it to the array known F at the position index I. How about that? Pretty neat. Think about this dynamic programming idea, this dictionary method. It's a simple example, but it's so effective, so powerful. Dynamic programming, dictionary method. Yeah. For this class, we cannot spend too much time on this topic, but here we can treat this example as a simple introduction to dynamic programming. Okay, all right, already 6.45, so let us stop right here.